Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Angie Barker Jackson and I am the Vice President for Institutional Advancement at Berkeley School of Theology. We are delighted that you have joined today's first Friday Lunch and Learn session. If you haven't already done so, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. And if it's lunch or snack time, feel free to enjoy your lunch or snack, um, but keep yourself muted if you don't mind. This series is sponsored and planned by the Alumni Engagement Office at BST. Melissa LeBeouf, Assistant Director of Alumni and Donor Engagement is co-hosting with me today. She will be monitoring the chat for your questions um, so that later in the presentation, um, we have those queued up and ready to go for our presenter um, following uh, her presentation. Just a reminder, Melissa is your source for information about future events sponsored by the alumni office. Um, Melissa, thanks for everything that you do. These lunch and learns have been designed with the three purposes of learning, connecting, and being in mind. Each month we feature a different topic and a new guest, and our hope is that the topics will stretch and challenge our minds, that we'll connect and reconnect with others in the BST network, and that this will be a space of radical belonging. On this first day of Women's History Month, our guest presenter is Reverend Dr. Valerie Miles Tribble, BST Professor of Ministerial Leadership and Practical Theology. Dr. V engages liberation theology as a womanist scholar, practical theologian, and community activist pastor to raise critical awareness of systemic oppressions. She was the 2021 GTU Distinguished Faculty Lecturer and holds dual GTU department um, faculty status in the theology and ethics, as well as religion and practice, um, and integrates theoethics with intersections of social justice praxis in church and society for restorative public approaches. She currently chairs the GTU Religion and Practice Department and serves as core doctoral faculty. She is the author of Change Agent Church in Black Lives Matter Times, Urgency for Action, which was published um, in 2020. Dr. V is a favorite professor among BST students. She teaches in all of our degree programs, integrating womanist and practical theological lenses. Her research is focused in leadership theory, adaptive change theory, and organizational development, and it examines behavioral ethics and justice dynamics for churches, communities, and society. She views public theology as an essential component of practical theology and believes that in this complex world, discipleship and positive social change must be viewed as interconnected. Her prophetic ministry extends beyond the pulpit to revitalize hope in communities, challenge injustice, and help folks move from disenfranchised to empowered. We are so excited to have Dr. V here. Um, a little about her personally, she's, she's a self-professed foodie, coffee fiend, she says, an avid jazz and music lover, a distance walker, and a traveler and cultural sleuth. Welcome today, Dr. Valerie Miles Tribble. We are delighted for you to share engaging women's voices. Do we listen to learn or teach to tell? Take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you for that very kind introduction. And it is indeed a pleasure to be with all of you. And so uh, as usual, I probably have way more slides than that than the hour would take. So I'm gonna jump right into it, given that we are on the, the cusp, so to speak, of Black History Month, as well as International Women's Month. And so I was uh, very honored when uh, Melissa and Angie asked me to, to do this. And it was really inspirational for me to uh, think about how to approach 
that topic after I gave you the title I was like what did I mean by that <laughs> so it's been it's been fun to to unpack it so I'm going to um share my slides so that hopefully we can get into it and the slide deck as I often do um I will uh offer to Melissa and Angie, if any of you want to get a copy of it, you're certainly welcome to it. So um, as uh, Angie said, engaging women's voices, do we listen to learn or teach to tell? And this rhetorical question invites us to just ponder the variety of voices, the ways that women's voices are used, and the methods that we use to be heard. And as we so circle the globe today, virtually, real and, and quickly, I hope that you'll be inspired by some and just a very, very small tip of the iceberg, some of the diverse ways that women lead. And as we know, as leaders, women are at the forefront of health reform, public justice, education, faith cultivation, family, community, advocacy. Uh, but those, those efforts are not always welcomed in all societies and all spaces. So do we listen to learn? Do we teach to tell and how? If we learn, we learn if we listen. And I think the purpose of listening is to discern and discover. And we teach not just to, to tell and look like we know it all. Hopefully we use our voices to encourage raised awareness. And yet both of those things, listening and teaching, uh, learning and, and telling, they're only effective when we also act to move or change status quo spaces. And so that's the big question. How do we do that? Engaging women's voices really has far reaching opportunities because women tend to understand intuitively that there's strength in numbers. And maybe that's because we, over the course of, of, of time, history, we are very in tune with the fact that women have often been marginalized. So when we work, we tend to be collaborators, we tend to be strategists, we tend to find some other voices besides our own. Women also work together in interreligious networks. And uh, at the top of the screen, uh, someone is holding a picture of Malala. And I don't know if you have read her book, this very courageous at the time that the book was published, very courageous. Uh, Iranian teenager who was going to school and the society did not want girls to get education and they actually began to bomb the schools and she was injured in one of those bombings. So again, not only interreligious but intergenerational is, is the work that we do and where you find uh, women young and seasoned using their voices. So let's talk about listening to learn. First of all, you're listening with discernment. And part of that discerning is then using our voices to align with our interreligious sisters and brothers, which requires deep listening to learn ways that might not be familiar to us, and then finding ways to work together. We also align with intercultural sisters and brothers, which require sharing narratives to discover and appreciate where we have shared values. So one of the things I wanted to point out, because I, I learned this uh, from a friend of mine who is uh, Sikh means learner or seeker of truth, and that Sikhism uh, pro uh, advocates equality, social justice, service to humanity, and tolerance for other religions. In Arabic, Muslim means one who submits to God. And the Baha'i faith, 
The Baha'is believe in oneness of humanity, devotion to uh, themselves, devoting themselves to the abolition of race, class, and religious prejudices. And the bulk of the Baha'i teachings are concerned with social ethics. So when we come together and find these common threads and frameworks, then there are things that we can talk about and work together on rather than assuming we know and consider each other the enemy. Now, still as we celebrate many contemporary women of today, remember that women have embodied leadership since the ancient of days, since the antiquity, women of faith engaged in the nurture and care of families and communities. And in the Bible, we have courageous women like midwives, Shipra and Pua, who use their voices and actions as crafty resistors with justice acts to counter Pharaoh, who was intent on genocide. And so I give you the scripture there because hopefully you'll look up some of these past passages and reread these texts through the lens of the discussion today. And of course, we remember in the Abrahamic saga, we remember Hagar, who despite abuse and rejection was the first woman to be promised a nation. Cast out, she wandered with her child in the wilderness of Beersheba, and an angel of God spoke. And there's two textual accounts or traditions in our uh, text. Uh, Erica made sure to look at that. And uh, these two traditions identify Hagar as the mother of nomadic nations. And so one tradition in Genesis 16 says, the angel of God spoke and said, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. So she named the Lord. Hagar gave God a name who spoke with her and said, you are Elroy, for I have really seen God and lived. So even in the ancient of days, women were using their voices to affirm their relationship and the intervention of God in their lives. The second tradition in Genesis 21, 18 says, come lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand. I will make a great nation of him. And then God opened her eyes where she saw an oasis with water and she was able to save her struggling child. So Hagar then, uh, as you continue to read in that tradition, also demonstrates being a strategist for obviously they survived and went on to, to better times because the word says, and, and we know the Old Testament text sometimes doesn't say a lot, but that in that one sentence, there's a lot of meaning. And it says she found a bride for her son in Egypt. So that means that Hagar was determined and used this encounter and her continued faith in God to survive and thrive. Also in the Exodus story has, has Miriam and her infant brother Moses, whom she sought to protect from genocide. And of course, preachers preach and preach and preach about Moses, but Miriam being the daughter of Amran and Jacobed was the older sister of Moses and Aaron, born in ancient Egypt. She's referred to as a prophetess in the Torah and wise in the Talmud. And Miriam used her voice to stir the people, led the fleeing people to offer praise to God for deliverance. And so you can, that imagery in the text uh, shows that our voices also can teach through music, song, and worship. And the word in Exodus 15 says, then the prophet Miriam took a tambourine in her hand and all the women, went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. Can't you just imagine the wonderful clamor of praise as Miriam sang to them? In the gospels, we have courageous yet nameless women who followed Jesus despite the ancient social mores that they were supposed to stay home and not be seen. The faith and the courage of these Marys and many women must not be ignored at the cross and at the tomb. 
and Mary Magdalene was the first to encounter the risen Christ. And in the account of John 20, 1 through 18, she also was the first commission to proclaim the news to the disciples. So here we have textual evidence of the first anointed female preacher. Somebody say amen. As we move through the times and come into our contemporary times, we are reminded, uh, particularly as we have celebrated Black History Month and those of us who, for whom many of these spaces are familiar, we realize that for the most part, these are people also of faith. They understand that they have not gotten where they uh, were able and what they were able to achieve by themselves. And so faith is the tie that binds an intergenerational and international drive for justice, even though justice is still fleeting and even though justice is still not yet won. So women's voices teach then as global change agents. Their voices speak despite the risk. And one of the many women that came to mind as I was trying to find examples is Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi, who was born as Indira Faroos Nehru, uh, 1917 to 1984. She was an Indian teacher and a politician who served as the third prime minister of India from 1966 to 1977, and again from 1980 until her assassination in 1984. So to me, Indira Gandhi embodies a leader who spoke out about justice, who took risks, and even risked her life and lost her life in her campaign for the people. And her voice says in her own words, to be liberated, women must feel, must feel free to be herself, not in rivalry to man, but in the context of her own capacity and her personality. I also like this beautiful, beautiful visual, which I hope that as I'm going through this, you're glancing at and, in, and inspired by. I'm not trying to read every word in every slide or I won't get through all of them. So we teach to tell, we listen to learn. And this very, very interesting woman is an Indian American gynecologist, Dr. Yuma Mysorakor. And I may be messing up the English. I wasn't able to get a hold of my colleague to get the correct pronunciation. But she is a gynecologist and on, uh, oncologist um, hailing from the Kartanaka region of India. And she received the Interfaith Center of New York's 2023 James Park Morton Interfaith Award. Now she did not receive that for her medical practice. She serves as president of a Hindu temple society of North America, one of the oldest Hindu temples in the United States located in Queens. And since the 1980s, she's been part of its administration as it expanded facilities, as well as its programming for seniors and young adults. The temple kitchen is available on food delivery apps. And she's convinced that in Hinduism, Women can be leaders simply by virtue of their ability to communicate the faith to others and notably to children, raising them up in the way that we want them to go. In her voice, she says, I didn't get involved to become a president, but when the circumstances were forced in, I did accept that challenge. So women teach to tell and listen to learn and are willing to act, to step into areas where we are needed. So this 
interfaith gathering is another example of where women use their voices to teach and to learn. This is uh, an example of Contra Costa County's Interfaith uh, Council. And the woman in the middle, in the orange, very beautiful woman is my friend, Dr. Erica Baines, who is uh, of the Sikh faith heritage. And her husband, who is a surgeon in the Kaiser system, apart from their professional lives, Dr. Erica uh, is uh, 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 earned her PhD uh, with me. And uh, her husband is a medical doctor. And apart from those professional lives, they travel several times a year to India, as well as to other underserved nations to make sure that they provide free service to children who need eye surgeries or who need cleft palate surgeries, who need other surgeries with their limbs, uh, since he's an orthopedic surgeon. And they go with a team to provide this uh, free service for people in need. Here with the local interfaith council for Christmas, uh, this, just this year, she helped coordinate the distribution of 2,500 food boxes to families throughout Contra Costa County. And when I asked her why she does this, she says, I do what I do because we must. Women also use their social justice voices for listening and teaching. And here, I was excited to discover this rather rare photograph, but I stumbled upon it and I was so ecstatic. This is a photograph of a Baptist women's group assembled in 1930 in Chicago, which offers a rare view of prominent African-American women activists working together. And in this photo is Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, journalist Ida B. Wells Barnett, religious leader Nanny Helen Burroughs, who were all tireless advocates for civil rights amid evils of racism, sexism, and lynching. They rarely had a chance to come together. This is why this picture is, is, is so rare because they lived and worked out of different parts of the United States. But the important point here is that the Black Women's Club movement came about to empower women of color and gained momentum at the height of the women's suffrage movement where black women were not welcome. So again, part of the strategist, part of the using and teaching to tell, part of the listening to learn is to find ways still to empower others as well as ourselves. In particular, Ida Wells Barnett led a newspaper and helped to start the National Council of Negro Women to encourage women's voices to promote voting rights, labor wages, education access. Many of her publications spoke against the uh, uh, lynchings that were very common in the South. And in her words, she says, no nation, savage or civilized, save only the United States of America, has confessed its inability to protect its women, save by hanging, shooting, and burning alleged offenders. Many of you may be familiar with the name Dolores Huerta. Dolores Clara Fernandez Huerta is still active in the Bay Area. And she was born in a mining town in New Mexico. Her father was a farm worker and miner by trade. And he was also a union activist who ran for political office and won a seat in the New Mexico legislature in 1938. And after the parents divorced, Dolores spent her childhood and early adult years in Stockton with her mother and two brothers. And she joined Cesar Chavez and migrant workers movement as a very active and visible part of that. And their mantra 
Si se puede, yes, we can, yes, you can, became a mantra that here now, even today in community organizing, we often chant as we are in public actions. According to Dolores, her mother's independent entrepreneurial spirit was the one reason she became a feminist. Her mother, Alicia, was known for kind and compassionate help. She saved her money from hard work to acquire a 70-room hotel, and she welcomed low-wage workers, often waiving the fee for them altogether. And so she and Dolores were active participants in community affairs, in civic organizations, and the church. And cultural diversity was a natural part of Dolores' upbringing in Stockton because the agricultural community was made up of Mexican, Filipino, African American, Japanese, and Chinese working families. And so in Dolores' voice, she says, a feminist seed was planted by my mother. Then we have the powerful voice of Fannie Lou Hamer. And she says in her own voice, sometimes it seems like to tell the truth today is to run the risk of being killed. But if I fall, I'll fall five feet, four inches forward in the fight for freedom. I'm not backing off. She also said, when I liberate myself, I liberate others. If you don't speak out, ain't nobody gonna speak out for you. Fannie Lou Hamer was a sharecropper a cha change, a justice change agent, a voter rights activist, a community organizer. She was a state leader and delegate to one of the presidential uh, 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 nominations or delegations. And what people don't know, she also had planned to run for Congress and she said she was gonna go all the way to the presidency. Sadly, that was before cancer overtook her. But in this picture, she's also shown with another uh, soldieress for justice, Ella Baker, who was the organizer and uh, advocate for the young adults organization, SNCC. So I'm, uh, with the help of, of, of Angie, I want you to listen to just this snippet. I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, and and ask that Angie play this uh, snippet, just going to be just a clip of a, of a larger clip in Fannie Lou's words so that you can hear her and her words uh, talking about we'll never turn back. Dr. V, the mm -hmm. Fannie Lou Hamer video that came up when I followed the link is pretty long. Is it just the beginning section? Yeah, I, I asked you to stop at 5.55. Start it from the beginning and stop at 5.55. Okay, I can do that. Thank I you. Can do that. So let me get this all ready. Okay. Let me go full screen here. There's the light line. I'm Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. My mom used to always sing this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Her singing had an urgency about it, an urgency for people to listen, for people to know that they were working for a cause and everybody needed to join in because there was so much against the black people back then. My name is Jacqueline Hamer Flakes, and I'm the youngest and only living daughter of the late civil rights activist, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer. P. 
people have written books, they have made movies, they have done bios, but they really don't know the real Fannie Lou Hamer. We have been black, powerless people for 400 years. My name is Monica Land, and Fannie Lou Hamer was my great aunt. Her husband, Pat, and my maternal grandfather were brothers. One of the things that I saw that was missing in all of the documentaries and clips that I'd seen on F Aunt Fannie Lou was the family element, um, stories that I had been told and heard my entire life. Those were missing. That personal side of her life was missing, and I thought people needed to see that. Aunt Fannie Lou had always said was that she had spoken at every college and university campus there was. And once we started researching this film, we saw that that was just about true. She had a very large presence. I've been very concerned with young black people in Mississippi. And there's no need of getting an education, running to some other place. Fight and make it right here. I'd take a chance in Mississippi quicker than I would Chicago. Because we at least know where we are here. But they got some of the same hypocrites up there. It's just like these white racist guys. Right. I just thought, you know, why not let her tell her own story? She was known, you know, for her public speaking. She was such a fiery speaker. I didn't come to Washington to hear no bills being legislated that they would feed me in 1972. What in the world is going on between 1972? I'm thinking about what you gonna do for my people in December. When she spoke before other people, she told them about her background, her history, the cotton fields, where she came from. And so it just seemed natural to just build that and let her tell her own existence. See, Mississippi is not actually Mississippi's problem. Mississippi is America's problem. My name is Jimmy Lee Lacey, and Aunt Fanny is my great aunt. She was the baby of, of the family. She believed truly uh, in God. To have a family was kind of a religious family, and, and, and you was going to do something in the church. If she was there, you were going to do something, whether it was sing, pray, preach, or whatever. It looked like everybody was quiet. And if they weren't a preacher, there's a Sunday school teacher or a Sunday school superintendent. We all, we were brought up like that. But we was taught to love everybody, whether you was white or black. Uh, skin never made a difference with her when it come down to the righteous or come down to being right. In the same way with, with wrong. If you're wrong, it didn't make no difference what color you were. If you were wrong, she told you you was wrong. If I hate you because you hate me, I'm no better than you are. And all we want to do is to make these people understand that we are human beings and we can work together. Long before she got involved in civil rights, she was saying, We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. We are tired of working for three million dollars a day, going home and being too tired to cook what little we did have. Because Thank you, Angie. There we go. Okay. So again, you see the power in hearing the person's voice firsthand. So when women's voices teach to tell, they proclaim truth to power, to push against closed doors. They speak to challenge and enlighten, to dissenter toxic masculinity or presumptive privilege. They tell affirming narratives to set the record straight, lifting personhood, virtue ethics, and identity. And another sister soldier that I discovered is Narjis Mohammadi, a jailed Iranian woman's rights advocate. She was awarded the 2023 Nobel Peace Prize while she's still incarcerated. 
She's the former vice president of the Defenders of Human Rights Center organization. And Mohammadi, at 51 years old, has done her work despite facing numerous arrests, spending years behind bars for her activism. She's been in prison 13 times and convicted five times. And in total, she's been sentenced to 31 years in prison. She's behind bars this time for the recent protests over the death of 22-year-old Masha Amini in police custody. And that sparked one of the most intense challenges ever to Iran's theocracy. From behind bars, somehow she got to write an op-ed for New York Times. And so this is her words. What the government may not understand is that the more of us they lock up, the stronger we become. This hits close to home, my friends, because here at the GTU, we have a few students from Iran and particularly the female one was to come and speak at our association, our, our AAR meetings, and was warned from Iran that if she spoke and if she said anything negatively about the government, her family all the way in Iran could be in danger as well as herself here in the United States. Womenist voices were also pioneers and these are pictures of some of the theology students at Union Theological Seminary, not, not me in the picture. I'm there with one of my mentors who was, but they started out as students in the 80s at the Union Theological Seminary. And they raised their voices in protests to their professor, Dr. James Cohn, about his male-focused Black Liberation Theology Manifesto. It was from that that they used the literary genius of Alice Walker, who had written about being womanish. And they coined that phrase and developed womanist theology, womanist ethics, womanist social thought, womanist anthropology, and on and on into all of the interdisciplinary aspects of womanist thought so that African-American women could also have their voice. So I'd like to stop, share, and ask Angie to play this short clip in Dr. Katie Cannon's words, because Dr. Katie Cannon, let me just go back first and show you her picture sitting here. Dr. Katie Cannon is considered the mother of womanist thought and thinking. Dr. Katie Cannon went through Union Theological Seminary thinking that she was about to go for start her dissertation and uh, uh, acquire a uh, PhD in uh, Hebrew and in the Old Testament and was told by uh, the committee of, of faculty, uh, largely white male, that there was no way they were going to approve her for such a degree. So she had to start over and redid her studies in ethics and used her voice to proclaim this. So that gives you some background to what you will hear in her comments. I'm going to stop share and ask uh, Angie to share that clip. Identity, I think is essential for agency, that we got to know who we are, uh, that that philosophical statement to our own self be true. If we don't know who self is, how can we be true to self? Or the golden rule, do unto others, you have them do unto you. Uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you don't love self, you can't love neighbor. And so one of the things that I'm grateful for in my theological education is letting go of the warped Christianity that I learned in my home church and in my family life, which is the kind of Christianity that stomps out the self, that says it's what uh, joy is Jesus, others, and you. And it's like, no, joy is got to know, you got to know you first, got to know self first. Um, 
because if I put other people, what the war of Christianity allowed me to do was make myself into a doormat, allowed me to consent to my own abuse, allowed people to take advantage of me, allowed me to put blindness on and put my head in the sand and ignore and not listen to my gut, not listen to the antenna going up, not listen to when I was in harm's way. So that powerful testimony, and I am exceedingly blessed to have spent time around uh, Dr. Katie and to have heard wisdom come from her voice. And so when women use visionary voices, uh, there is wisdom power, there is inspiration, and one of the uh, voices that I love to read and to hear when I am able to find tapes from her is Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor. She's an Episcopal priest, academic, and author. And I personally love how she refers to herself as writer, speaker, and spiritual contrarian. And so these are just some snippets in uh, Reverend Barbara's words. Sometimes we do not know until it comes to us through the soles of our feet, the embrace of a tender lover or a kindness of a stranger. When I take a breath, God's Holy Spirit enters me. When a cricket speaks to me, I talk back. Like everything else on earth, I am an embodied soul who leaps to life when I recognize my kin. And if this makes me a pagan, then I'm a grateful one. She also said, whoever you are, you are human. Wherever you are, you live in the world, which is just waiting for you to notice the holiness in it. So welcome to your own priesthood. Practice at the altar of your own life. So women use their voices to express support of one another, to listen and to rejoice when no one else will. Those are the affirming voices. And again, since Mary, mother of Jesus and cousin Elizabeth, women have been holding space to be present and to walk together. They're using relational voices. And then there are those intergenerational voices. The generations that we are raising up, the generations whose worldview is different from ours because the world is different from ours. And they see and they critique some of the places where we thought we had won with the days of the social gospel or civil rights. And yet we are still confronted by the same evils. So interracial, intergenerational voices and interracial voices, yes, are still speaking to bend the ark until freedom rings. And my friends, we must listen to those voices. So I wanna wrap up at BST. I want to affirm the diverse voices at Berkeley School of Theology. And this is just one of the programs. And I, I noticed that Yvonne was on with me. So I'm gonna say a public thank you to her for her patience in dealing with me, getting through and, and implementing this grant. But this was a RISE Northern California cohort of finding women up and down Northern California. Some traveled as from as far as Sacramento to be together on these Saturdays so that we could affirm one another and hear each other's stories and hug and hold each other. And BST was a large part of this support of women in ministry. Be mindful of your roots, whether your roots stem from Africa, whether your roots stem from Israel, whether your roots stem from Ireland or Cuba or whatever place. Be rooted in what we call in the African tradition, Sankofa, symbolized by this bird, whose feet, which you can't see in this picture, are pointed forward and yet the face is looking back with a seed, a seed of wisdom. And in the Sankofa stands for this word of wisdom. You can't know where you're going 
unless you appreciate where you've come from. What this signifies, dear sisters and brothers, don't be ashamed of what you've gone through. Learn from it, listen to it, and then teach and tell it. For in all of our richness of diversity of cultures and colors and backgrounds, we even learn from those negative experiences. And at BST, since our job is about being in the work of preparing leaders for the complexities of this world, we must affirm that women can cultivate their voices to pray and preach and practice without censorship. Because Lord knows we go to so many places where they're still trying to do that. We're about the business of helping men and women hone skills and listen to learn and teach to tell others. We're about the business of accepting you in all of your wholeness, non-binary, binary, whatever identities and pronouns you use. We are about affirming what you want to learn and the vision that you have. So I want to thank you for listening. And now I want to invite us to just talk a bit. Ooh, we've been to church. We have about six or seven minutes where we could take a question, maybe two. We'll see, it looks like Dr. C.S. has his hand up. It, it's very quick question. <clears throat> I was just curious, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. V, and thank you. This was fantastic, um, uh, especially the clip on Hamer. That's just, that's great. I'll be sure to watch that whole video. Um, what did James Cohn say to that group that went and, um, and pushed back? I'm very curious. Was he receptive? Uh, he was receptive initially a bit defensive according to my mentor and others uh but what the the group of women did there are about five or six of them uh because in the classes with dr Cohn, they were receiving a lot of negative pushback from their fellow male classmates um they just wanted them to keep quiet and, and find their place because there wasn't any preaching jobs out there for them anyway, you know, it was basically the feedback. And so Cone had to make the decision to not let that divide occur in the classroom. And so he spoke up and affirmed their um, uh, uh, ability to, to, to lead, to have a voice, et cetera. So what the women embarked upon was just this writing research campaign. And that provided the seeds of, of these 35 years plus of, of, of womanist thought and has now developed into um, several disciplines at the uh, AAR and uh, SPL. Indeed, what a great story. What a yeah, great story. He start. finally did publish a book publicly apologizing mm. uh, and spoke on it in many places, yeah. Dr. V, there's a question in the chat that came early during your presentation. I'm going to read it for you. Okay. And it's, it's from LaDonna Harris, mm -hmm. um, one of our scholars here at BST. And she says, as we hear about the challenges of Bishop Plunder at the American Baptist College, Reverend Dr. Gina Stewart at the NBC, the National Baptist Convention, and Reverend Dr. Ebony Marshall Tr Terman at Abyssinian, and she says so many more, how do we show up to support women who are experiencing marginalization in the public square? I think that we um, that we um, listen to learn. So first of all, be very discerning in culling through Ladonna all the 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 comments and 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 sort of hot air and fluff that you hear on social media. Um, I'm a researcher, so I always, as is, I see uh, my 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 student and and uh, friend Margot Freeman on here. You you call and you you look for information so that you can make sure you have 
all sides of the story to help you discern and and formulate a, a, a response. And that helps you to kind of weed out some of the uh, the thoughts or or the opinions. And then we have to use our our, our teaching voices to tell and to express what it is that, that, you know, our view or what we think is going on. And so in the case of, uh, I'll just use uh, Reverend Gina Stewart as an example, in the case of the uh, National ba Baptist Convention, where many women were there, and those of us even who watched it uh, on live stream saw the men leaving the stage. And those who were there said even more were leaving the audience when it finally hit them, what she was brilliantly preaching about in, in a hermeneutic that actually was critiquing them, even though she stayed very close to the scripture. So again, the spirit will always convict those who need to be convicted. And we just need to do what many did around the country was to speak up in support of her. And we made sure that video got circulated so many places so that even when National Baptist Convention took it down, claiming they had a technological glitch, it was still going everywhere and went vi viral and global. Wow. So again, being a strategist, we gotta be strategists we got to be bold enough to, to, to tell, and we have to, though, make sure that we're not lemmings following a party line that might be wrong. We have to do our research so we can document it. Thank you for that brilliant response to that question, and that's so helpful for those of us um, that are thinking about those things. Oh, Dr. B, I cannot express enough gratitude to you today for giving us so much to think about, um, resources to read and watch online to kind of um, feed our curiosity um, and for the challenge that you have laid before us. Um, thank you so My very much for being with us today. Before we sign up, oh, go ahead. Could you do me a favor, Angie or Melissa? Could you just take a screenshot of the chats because I'm talking and I haven't had a chance to to look at them. I they would pop up, but I couldn't read them, and I'd love to be able to look at them later. I'll send you a copy. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Before we log off, as per usual, I have just a couple of announcements to make. Our next First Friday Lunch and Learn will be on Friday, April 5th, and will be led by Dr. Hannah Kang, Assistant Professor of Practical Theology. I'm super excited about um, April. Her presentation is entitled Latinx Diversity as Our Pride and Challenge, and it will be offered simultaneously in Spanish and English, the first presentation of its type in our programming. We are so delighted um, for her creativity and for um, offering this topic. And we are especially excited to center the perspectives and voices of our Latinx siblings in this session. Please come. Uh, Melissa is dropping the registration link in the chat. Also in April on the 17th and 18th, Wednesday and Thursday, BST's Center for Truth, Racial Healing, and Restorative Justice will hold two related events, a book signing and a lecture with Dr. William Darity and Ms. Kirsten Mullen, um, authors of the book From Here to Equality. Um, the, this couple are premier voices um, on uh, reparations, and we would love for you to join us for those events to learn more um, from these significant scholars. We hope you will come for one or both of those evenings. If you know someone who needs theological education and would like to be part of a diverse community like Dr. B was talking about, please refer them to us. We host monthly information sessions on Zoom and our amazing admission staff would be delighted to speak with them. And the final announcement, um, save the dates for Leap into Community. Um, an in-person alumni gathering on Saturday, May 18th, the day of commencement, where the alumni community will offer a service of blessing and welcome our graduates into the BST alumni family.
Thank you again for participating with us today, and we can't wait to see you next time. Have a great weekend, everyone.